Christ Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aris Tarsus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. What a heartfelt and touching expression of the love that Paul had for those brethren, Philemon and Onesimus, that we read there in the book of Philemon. There are different advantages to having an expository sermon where you look at a certain section of Scripture. This is a very small one. It takes care of a whole book of the Bible. If your desire is to read through the Bible this year, then you just got the book of Philemon. Check it off, my friend. Due to Brother Coley's work, you are done with that book. Somebody says, well, I didn't read it. I count hearing it just as much as actually looking at it and reading it. The Bible counts them the same way, whether you hear it or you actually read it and looked at it. Therefore, I count them that way when it comes to my own Bible readings as well. So you need to go ahead and count that one. The book of Philemon is done. When you think about this book, there are so many heartwarming things about it that I want to touch on a few of them with you this morning. And in order to help you in your study with it, there is a study guide that is out there if you want to do some further study on Philemon and quiz yourself about your knowledge of the book then you can pick one of those up as you leave out today on the desk out there as you enter in the main doors then you can grab one of those study guides okay that's just a little follow-up for you so that you can continue in looking at some things from this book maybe put it in your little notebook if you have one on Philemon something like that there are many things that I'd like to use to illustrate the situation here in Philemon and things that we can talk about that uh, show you what I mean when I say a heartwarming book. For example, of different individuals, different people that you can think of as uh, themselves being impacted and their hearts warmed by what we have done. First of all, Somebody came up to me at Bible Bowl from yesterday. And so as they approached me, it was in the family of a little girl that had had a heart transplant, Sophie Taylor. I had talked to her, and she was in a pew packer class. It's a little girl in a meeting that I'd had this past summer. We added her on the prayer list, and you all started sending your cards and prayers her way. Her surgery has gone well. She, of course, will be on medication probably the rest of her life to make everything keep functioning correctly and that there be no rejection and such as that. And the family was so appreciative. They've never been to Will Ed, as far as I know, but she was talking to me and she said that as she continues to improve Sophie and stuff, she said, we have got to get up there. She said, we have got to get over there to see you all. We have enjoyed that and thank you so much. Isn't that good? That's just really what you like to hear as a result of our card and prayer ministry. Not only that, but we visit people locally over here, uh, have been uh, talking to, and uh, we've been supplying things through our Meals on Wheels to uh, Ronald and Barbara Smith. They want you to know that they are so appreciative of that. They thank the church here for your heartwarming expressions of food and uh, just your well wishes for them that they be feeling good and that they have everything that they need. It, brethren, it makes a difference with people how you talk to them and how you treat them. I want you to think with me for just a moment. The Apostle Paul had evidently converted this Philemon fellow. The Philemon man is a man of some means. After all, he seems to have a guest house. He's got servants. He's got the ability to house the church in his house. I mean, he's a man of some substance. And yet Paul, when he speaks to him, does not speak to him as somebody who is either above or below him, but a beloved brother, somebody who appeals to him and says, I want you to think about what is honorable, what is good for you to do on behalf of your servant Onesimus. Onesimus was evidently a runaway or unprofitable servant or slave of Philemon. And I'll talk about the idea of slavery, yeah, here in a few minutes. But really the message of Philemon is not about slavery, is it? It's a message that says God is bigger than any situation in life. And if you would just turn your heart over to him, 
then everything will work out for the very best. Folks, you can look at Philemon and you can try to focus upon minor things all day long. But the best way to approach Philemon is to focus on the big stuff and to get lessons out of it instead of worrying about all the little details. Now, let me illustrate that for you and explain to you what I mean. Paul talks about being a prisoner, doesn't he? I could spend five or ten minutes with you all up here talking about this stage of Paul's ministry and how that we know he was released and then imprisoned a second time after that before his martyrdom. We could go in that and go over and over. I've already spent longer on it than I want to. That's not the message of the book. That's not the big question. Young people that were at Bible Bowl yesterday, you went over there and you're answering questions at Bible Bowl? Okay, if you missed one and the question was something like, uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus mentions and says that many will come from thee. Did he start out with the word north, A, east, B, or south, C? You know, that kind of thing. If you missed your direction, that's not a big deal. Don't be down on yourself if you missed that question. On the other hand, if you were asked a question like, in Matthew 26, Jesus talks about, in beginning the Lord's Supper, the fruit of... Uh, of the vine and he talks about the cup that means he was talking about a that he was talking about his blood B he was talking about you know something else or something else you need to know that he was referencing the blood of Christ don't you because that's the cup that's the fruit of the vine you need to know that if you don't know that that's a big point from Matthew 26 now you need to go back and study on Matthew 26 if you missed that question and you thought it represented the bread, uh, the bread uh, or talking about his body, or if you thought that it was referencing some other aspect of worship or something that they mentioned. No, no, no. The cup, the fruit of the vine, is representative of the blood, isn't it? You've got to know that. Otherwise, you're not prepared to take of the Lord's Supper later on in your life. There are little questions, and then there are big questions. Philemon, I want us to think about the big questions, all right? Don't get bogged down in the little stuff. Sometimes I know you have to sweat the details. For example, I try to send out more often than I used to emails to the church about what's going on. They wanted me to do that. Sometimes it's hard to do that when you all have email addresses that don't work anymore. Minnie Mouse is in the house at yahoo.com. Your email is disabled, okay? Now I'm serious. I don't know who you are. All I know is, is that you're junking up my mailbox because it keeps kicking it back to me saying that Minnie Mouse is in the house, can no longer receive emails. Maybe you need to switch to Mickey, I don't know. But it, that's a little detail you didn't have to know, wouldn't it? But sometimes those little details get in the way. Yes, Onesimus was a slave. That's a detail. But how Paul is addressing Philemon, the love that he shows... How Philemon is going to deal with that situation of his runaway slave. That is what needs to be addressed. Slavery just was something back then. It was what it was. I'm not saying it was good, but that's just the way it was. Everybody had it. Everybody understood it. If you were poor and you couldn't pay your debts, maybe you sold yourself into slavery. If your tribe lost the war, then maybe you were captured and put into slavery. There were different reasons why people ended up being slaves. They existed everywhere. Everybody understood them. Paul's job was not to come along and to tell Philemon how bad a person he was because he had forced servants. Paul's job was not to come along and to tell society that all the slaves needed to revolt and foment wars in society. That's not his job. His job was to say, if you're a master, you better be good to your fellow man. Are you a servant? You better serve your master according to the agreement that you made. Both of you had better be Christian. Now see, that's the big message. That's what he wanted them to understand. And somebody says, yeah, but that's a bad situation. Well, how do you deal with that bad situation? Just like Paul did. He appealed to the honor of Philemon. Philemon, my brother beloved. This one I have converted in my bonds, Onesimus, I'm sending him back to you. 
But I'm talking to you, brother of my heart. I want you to deal with him in a way that I know would be good, and I have confidence that you'll do more than what I ask of you. My beloved brother. You see how he's appealing to him? You see that way in which he's talking to him? When we are being good to somebody, when we appeal to them for repentance through humility, then you're doing the very best you can to win a soul to Jesus Christ. You're doing the best you can to help them. My friend, if you want to go around and win an argument with somebody, you can do that. And you may feel good in yourself that you were on the right side and all that stuff, but it's not going to help you in the end. What is going to help you is to see that soul come to Jesus Christ. And to do that, you need to lovingly and sincerely appeal to them. The book of Philemon proves it. Proves it over and over again. It shows the honorableness of Paul. That we are to behave honestly in the sight of all men. That we are to behave according to the principles he laid down in the book of Romans and other places. And he would not keep Onesimus. He said, no, no, I might just write to you and tell you, now you do what I say, I'm an apostle of the Lord. But it wasn't like that. He appealed to his heart. He also understood that repentance demands restitution. Onesimus has hurt you. He's not been, uh, perhaps he was a poor man that agreed to give service unto Philemon because he couldn't take care of his family. That was a common problem back then. And so he would say, look, I'll be your slave, but you give us a parcel that we can live on so my family can have bread to eat. That was something that people did back then. So for whatever reason, he's definitely Philemon's servant. He's got to be sent back to him. He sends Onesimus back to him, and Onesimus has to show proper restitution. I talked to a bunch of people today, and they missed one of the big points here of the book of Philemon. Onesimus is sent back to his master not because slavery is good. It's bad. Onesimus is sent back to his master not because he is deserving of being whipped in any sense or that Philemon's going to do that to him. Onesimus is sent back to his master because he's making restitution for being a bad servant. He was unprofitable to you. But now he is a profitable servant of Jesus. That's bigger than what he was before. Now he's no longer your slave, Philemon. He is your brother in Christ. You treat him like a brother. I'm sending him back to you. Restitution, folks, means you've got to face your past. You've got to bury the hatchet and deal with whatever situation is bothering you this morning. Why can't you focus on the sermon? Why, when a Bible passage is given to you, are you all tore up and distracted? One of the reasons why is because the elephant in the room is this problem in your life and you say, oh, well, I'm sorry I ever did or said what I did, but you won't deal with it. Restitution. Onesimus is never going to be happy until he goes back to Philemon and faces his own demons. He's got to stand up there to that man and say, I have run away. I have done wrong. I was not a profitable servant unto you in the past. I am sorry. By Roman law, you could have me killed. But here is a letter from our brother Paul. Would you read that first? And you know that when the brother read that, that he understood what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to treat Onesimus in a good and kindly way. Onesimus had to have bravery to go back. Onesimus had to be somebody who faced up to the problems in his life. Repentance is not just sorrow. Repentance is restitution. I've got to fix this. I've got to repair the breach and fix my relationships. Furthermore, the book of Philemon is a very big and important book because it focuses on the providence of God. I have oftentimes been amazed at the book of Esther in the Old Testament. It never even mentions God. And yet in that book of Esther, you find that he says in Esther chapter 4 that perhaps you are in the kingdom for such a time as this. This is your time, Esther. Now, he didn't mention God, but that means God has put you here to get something done. All right, look with me in the book of Philemon, verse 15. Philemon 15. Perhaps he therefore departed for a season. Onesimus left you. He departed that you should receive him forever. 
This is a work of the providence of God, Paul is saying. God is working things out for the best. I don't see how people can live through life thinking about all the inequalities of life. It's not right that so-and-so has something and I don't have that. It's not right that this person was treated fairly and I was not. It's not right that I don't get my way when it comes to, you name it, whatever. That's a very frustrating life. But when you make up your mind that whatever happens in this life happens within the bounds of the ultimate will of God and that nothing has ever happened unto you that you cannot turn into something good. When life gives you a lemon, the old expression says, church, you're supposed to make, yeah, lemonade, there you go. Now that's simple, isn't it? If you are given a situation in life, you need to understand, if I could not handle this, God wouldn't have allowed me to go through it. Not only that, but if you're given a situation in life you don't want to be in, then this is a way for God to spur you on to greater works. You telling me, preacher, God gave me an illness so that I might serve him better? I am not telling you that. I'm telling you that whatever you run up against as Satan delivers it to you, God will turn it for good. Just read the book of Job. He'll turn it into something good. And Satan won't stop him from turning it into good. You see, the Lord understands you're not in heaven yet. And every situation in this life, you can either have a bad attitude and you can look at it being frustrated and you can look at it from the standpoint of commands and uh, punishments and all that kind of stuff or you can have the attitude of the book of Philemon where Paul appeals to the heart of Philemon and he says to him, brother, we have fixed this situation. Your unprofitable servant is now a brother in Christ. How are you going to receive your brother? Here is my letter to you. Does he owe you something? I'll pay it, Paul said. I'm writing it with my own hand. You know how truthful I am. I'll take care of it. How are you going to receive your brother? Philemon, I love this part. You know, uh, where would you be without Jesus? You owe me your own self. <laughs> Yeah, I, I own you, in other words. You think you own Onesimus, I own you in the sense that you wouldn't be anywhere with Jesus if I hadn't brought that gospel to you, in the sense that you would not be the man you are today if the Lord had not touched your life and sent him, me uh, to you to change you over to Jesus. Now, how are you going to treat your brother in Christ, my brother? and a profitable servant to me and you, Onesimus. He didn't command him anything, but he sure turned the heat up, didn't he? With what? With kindness, with remembrance, by showing him how important the Lord was to him in life. Do that with your family if you want to make progress. Do that with your friends if you want to be an influence unto them. Bring the truth to them in such a way that they understand you're not doing it in order to hit them over the head like with a sledgehammer. God's Word is a hammer. It hits hard, my friend. It's our job to make sure that that truth goes up, up against whatever they believe and whatever they've been doing in the best way possible. Because God's Word is powerful. You've got to watch what you're doing with it. One year I was watching my dad work on the tobacco barn. So he's going along and they're building a big old barn up back behind the house. And he loved to be able to get a rhythm going on putting his nails in. So he's up on the ladder and he had this little thing where he would, uh, you know, you size it up, you know, boom, 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 boom. And he'd get, get the nail and it, just a couple of hits and he had it in there. Big old hammer. Well, as he's doing that, he's going along, he's up on the ladder and then uh, boom, 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 boom. Well, what was the... I tell you what it was, where that hammer come down on his thumb. <laughs> he was like, huh. Boy, that's going to hurt when the pain has a chance to... Oh, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Here, here it comes. You know, losing the nail and everything. You know, just, just split his thumb wide open. That, that had to hurt. He missed the mark. What was he doing? 
It was a big hammer. It could drive a big old, I don't know, it was a 16-penny nail or whatever. It could drive it quick and drive it right on through that wood. He wouldn't have any problem driving it. It was a good-sized hammer. And when that hit his thumb, it left a mark, didn't it? If you don't watch it, the powerful word of God, as it says in the Old, Test Old Testament, is my word, not a hammer. It is likened in the New Testament unto a sword. Those are powerful instruments. You don't take the word of God and just casually use it or just waylay it around. You make sure you're doing it in the wisest way possible in order to help a soul. Do that with your own life and do it with other people. What kind of consideration do you want to give other people? The same kind that you want to be done for you. If you're not doing something right, you want somebody to approach you in a way that helps you, not that begs for a confrontation. So just do the best you can, just like Paul did with Philemon. This especially applies to a brother in Christ that you want to encourage or get them to change in their direction. Now, there are many other problems that we learn, of course. In addition to, yes, he deals with the problem of slavery. How does Christianity deal with slavery? Christianity says, hey, if everybody is Christian, that person would be your brother. How are you going to deal with your brother? That eventually allows the situation of slavery just to disappear. And what has happened in the world? Except for places where they have a lot of lawlessness, slavery officially disappeared, didn't it? Why? Because the influence of Jesus Christ, the civilizing power of the gospel. Philemon stands out as a good Christian example for stewardship, like for example in verse 7, we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints are refreshed by you, brother. Philemon was a man of some substance. He gave unto the Lord's will, and that was recognized by God. And through uh, the Apostle Paul, he points out, Brother, you're a good steward of what God has given you. Thank you. The book of Philemon is concerned with the promotion of God's church. The profitable Onesimus was now able to help Paul in the ministry, and he hopes that he can be sent back to him. The book of Philemon is good for explaining brotherly love. Exactly how do you look upon a brother in Christ? As competition? No, no, far from it. As somebody that you can rejoice when they rejoice. Somebody that you can cry with them when they cry. Somebody whose success is your success. I never could play baseball or softball or anything worth a dime. Just never could. And... I'll be honest with you, if Tyler was honest also, he, he wasn't much better. But, but he did play in the community softball teams. You remember that from back in Cullioca? We did the best we could, didn't we? But there was a reason I wasn't one of the coaches. One time I remember, here comes that fly ball. Tyler just kind of, there it was. You remember that one? He still remembers it. All right. Hey, when he caught the ball... I caught the ball. Y'all know what I mean? That's right. That wasn't him catching the ball. That was me catching the ball. Yeah! That's how McHenry does it, boy. You see what I mean? That's what I was talking about. So when you have somebody in the church to experience success in life, you share that and you rejoice with them. Philemon, guess what? Onesimus, formerly unprofitable, now a profitable servant of the Lord. For you and for me, I'm sending him back to you. How are you going to receive your brother? Philemon, no doubt, as a good brother in Christ, is overjoyed. As somebody who is a good giver in the Lord's church, is ready to give once again his servant back to Paul. As somebody who has love toward the Lord, rejoices that his brother has found salvation. Okay, Paul, if it's going to be rough on me, you said you would repay it, but I'm going to receive him as my brother in Christ. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. A big message of the book of Philemon. I want to point out one other thing about Philemon here this morning. If you look later on in the description of people that was read by Brother Coley to us, then look down in verse 24. You will notice the name Marcus. Marcus. There salutes thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, verse 23, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul. 
you had already done your two missionary tours and then you're taken off as a prisoner. Remember he says he's the prisoner of the Lord Jesus? You, you've become a prisoner now and you're describing Marcus, Mark, as a fellow laborer? Yeah, yeah, what of it? Well, Paul, is that not the same Mark that did not continue in the work of the Lord in Acts chapter 13 and verse 13? Well, it's the only Mark I know of. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's Mark. Wait, wait, Paul, 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 is this not the same Mark that you argued with Barnabas about so much that you couldn't continue doing missionary work with Barnabas and he had to go one direction and you went another in Acts chapter 15? Yep, yep, that's the Mark that caused it all. He quit working with me and I didn't think it was good to take him on the next trip. And, you know, we decided we're just going to have to part company. If you think he's going to be a good worker, you take him that way and I'll take somebody else like Silas and I'll go a different direction. Well, what are you doing calling him a fellow laborer years later over here in Philemon verse 24? Because he's my brother in Christ. Because he's my brother. Now you see, if Paul could forgive, if Paul can let bygones be bygones and just let it go, what can you do? How many things have you done against God? He just lets it go, doesn't he? Through Jesus Christ, he says, I just forgive it. I just let it go. It's not worrying me. I made a way for you to be forgiven through Jesus. Why can we not be the same? Your sins, though they be as crimson, may become as white as snow. Though they be scarlet, yet they shall be as white as wool. Come unto the Lord. With open arms, He will forgive and He'll say, Hey, let's press the reset button. Let's start it all over again. I'll forgive everything. You want to be a good citizen in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? I don't care what you've done, God says. You're back in the fold. I'm ready to work with you. Now, if you never have called upon the Lord, then the Lord has been calling you your whole adult life. Come unto me. He wants you to get to work in God's kingdom. If you've been like Mark and you started to work in God's kingdom and you thought, man, this a, I don't know, this kind of life is not for me. It's not the way I want to go. God says, you can get back into the work of the Lord. Be a fellow laborer. I'll forgive. The Apostle Paul forgave as well. I'm not worried about that. That's in the past. The question is, is, is he serving God today? And Paul said, yeah, right now he's my fellow laborer. They greet you. Those brethren salute you in the Lord. And you can once again walk proudly among the brethren knowing that you've made things right with God if you're restored this morning. What's your need before God? Are you going to have the same kind of attitude that Paul and Philemon and Onesimus had? What kind of role do you play here? Were you bound in sin? Were you unprofitable unto God? It's time to turn that around. There was a day when the gospel came to this man Onesimus when he had run away from his master and he met up with Paul and God had the word of Christ preached unto him through the apostle and that won him over to the Lord. Now I've got to go back and face the music. I've got to fulfill my responsibilities, but I'll do it now as a Christian and I'll do it now knowing that my soul is all right with the Lord. Don't you be like Onesimus? Maybe you need to be like Philemon, concerned about the Lord's church, ready and willing to forgive, Maybe it is you haven't had those qualities and you need to come back to the Lord. 